Yeah, over to you, Dr. Amriti Baveja. Thank you, Kushiti. A very good evening to all of you. I welcome you for the master class in hematology organized under the ADs of ISHCP, the Indian Society of Hematology and Blood Transfusion. Today's topic is management of thalassemia, and it gives me an immense pleasure in introducing the speaker of the day, Dr. Rajiv Say, Professor, Department of Hematology, NRS Medical College, Kolkata. Since I know him personally, and though he is a renowned person who has done a lot of work in hematology, but he has a personal interest in thalassemia, and he has an excellent, he's an excellent teacher and an academician. Uh, now I welcome Dr. Rajiv Say for his class. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abhiti. Uh, thank uh, IACGPT organizer to, for this opportunity to allow me to talk on a topic, management of thalassemia. So this is a master class. I think uh, this is a class mainly dedicated for the students. So uh, my presentation is like a class only, not like a, a typical uh, presentation in conference or CME. And uh, I, I thank Abriti for her kind introduction. So uh, the duration of my talk is 45 minutes followed by a 15 minutes discussion. So uh, we know the structure of hemoglobin, which consists of mainly 4% uh, of heme molecule and 96% globin. So as we know, the most of the function of hemoglobin, uh, what we what you know as well, that is the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide. That is mainly done by the heme. So what is the function of 96% globin? And we know that nature doesn't create anything uh, for, for no use. So basically globin is there uh, to give hemoglobin molecule the stability. So if there is an abnormality of the globin chain, the hemoglobin becomes fragile. So that means when thalassemia is like that only. So thalassemia is the uh, abnormality of the globin chain, which makes hemoglobin molecule fragile and it causes the destruction of hemoglobin molecules at its formative phase in bone marrow. And so it is essentially a uh, ineffective erythropoiesis rather than a typical hemolysis or hemolytic anemia, uh, which is basically destruction of RBCs. But the global burden of thalassemia is huge because hemoglobinopathy, uh, is the commonest monogenic disorder globally, although the mostly it is sickle cell, uh, but there is at least uh, three lakh to four lakh babies with a severe hemoglobin disorder are born each year. And worldwide around 60,000 60, conception uh, with a major thalassemic disorders in every year. And if we see the, our Indian, Indian uh, statistics, Basically, uh, this Global Thalassemia Review Club published in 2021 by TIFF, Thalassemia International Federation, to give us a glimpse of the nature of thalassemia prevalence and thalassemia burden in different countries. So they have uh, mentioned each and every countries depending on the available literature published from those countries. And as for that uh, literature, uh, that review, we can see that this is the scenario of beta thalassemia, uh, that is a hemoglobinopathy uh, carrier status in the world. And we see that in, the, in uh, India and the uh, Southeast Asian countries, the Middle East, they are prevalent for the major hemoglobin disorders. And mainly uh, this is for beta thalassemia carrier. And E trait, if we see that they are mainly prevalent in the Southeast Asian countries and amongst India, the Northeastern states and the Eastern states, including West Bengal, they have a very high prevalence of hemoglobin E. And hemoglobin sickle, uh, in, as far as India is concerned, it, it is located in few states only, Odisha, uh, Madhya Pradesh. And the global prevalence of thalassemia is very much similar to the world distribution of malaria uh, in the last 20 years. It is also mentioned in the TIF guideline. So uh, they mentioned these articles to assess the prevalence of Indian, uh, Indian scenario. So if we say that it is not a representation of all the states, basically uh, there is mostly the states Right. 
Akash. So you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. So uh, if we see that the, all the states are not represented in the in this uh, TIF manifesto, so the states which are mainly represented are uh, Gujarat. Four articles are from there: Maharashtra and West Bengal. So as per as per these uh, statistics, uh, there are three to four percent are carrier rate of beta thalassemia carrier rate in uh, India, and uh, and uh, you know, 35 to 45 million carriers uh, are there in our multi-ethnic population. And uh, it is basically a burden to our thalassemic patients are really a burden to our healthcare because uh, you know, the prevalence of hemoglobin in India is 1.2 per 1,000 live births. And 10 to 12,000 thalassemic children are born annually. And it is very much underreported. We know uh, if we calculate properly, the, the uh, total actual number of thalassemia will be much more compared to what is mentioned over here. And we know that is, uh, there is an alpha and uh, alpha-like change and beta and beta-like change in chromosome number 11 and 16, uh, respectively. And there is a switch uh, in the perinatal phase, and so the HBF is converted to adult hemoglobin. So if there is a quantitative abnormality of the norm uh, of the beta globin chain, so there is relative increase of the fetal hemoglobin, HBF, and that is characterizes the uh, beta thalassemia. And we can see that uh, from, from the fetal life to the adulthood, there is sequential uh, changes in the different globin chains and the adult hemoglobin that is alpha to beta 2 takes its uh, mature, mature percentage from six months postnatal to one year postnatal phase. And uh, that chain which is defective and causes the quantitative abnormalities name are the thalassemia, names the type of thalassemia. That is alpha thalassemia means there is deficiency of alpha thalassemia, beta means there is deficiency of beta thalassemia. But as there are other structural hemoglobinopathies also like sickle, like E, so there is often compound heterozygous of thalassemia as well as some hemoglobinopathies. So which also uh, extends the complete thalassemic syndrome. That is, it may be a, a homozygous status of a thalassemia or it may be a compound heterozygous with thalassemia and a hemoglobinopathy like E beta thalassemia, sickle beta thalassemia, etc. Now, as far as phenotype is concerned, uh, we name now name thalassemia as TDT and MTDT. That is transfusion dependent thalassemia and trans non transfusion dependent thalassemia. And thalassemia trait or so called thalassemia minor, we don't consider them as a uh, thalassemic patient. Uh, the, as far as the pathophysiology of thalassemia is concerned, this is important. This is important from the management perspective because in thalassemia, the defective gene is not uh, responsible for the clinical manifestations. It is the unpaired normal uh, chain, globin chain, which actually causes the destruction of the RBC. So in, in suppose beta thalassemia, beta chains are less in amount. We know that hemoglobin is water soluble molecule, but individual globin chains are water insoluble. So in beta thalassemia, the unpaired alpha chain actually precipitates within the cells while in the, in the while they are in the bone marrow in the formative phase, and they causes this individual alpha globin chain. They causes membrane destruction, and this membrane destruction causes a fluid of methanol, serin, which is there inside the cells. They comes out. And this exposure of the phosphatidyl serine, they send uh, apoptotic signals and causes apoptosis. So this is the mechanism of the uh, thalassemia, uh, this is a pathophysiology of thalassemia. Now, so there is actually increased erythropoiesis. There is almost eight to 10 times more erythropoiesis compared to the normal population. So the thalassemia problem, if we want to counter or manage properly, then we need to suppress that ineffective erythropoiesis. So as, uh, uh, as for the phenotypic diversity, the 
the total syndrome of thalassemia is divided into TDT and NTT. Basically, that is a continuum. TDT means transfusion dependent thalassemia, those who need regular transfusion for survival. The NTT, NTT may sound like a misnomer because non transfusion dependent thalassemia, it may sound like they don't need uh, transfusion, but actually, it is not. Basically, they don't need transfusion for survival, but they need transfusion for other reasons. They need transfusion for some emergencies. They need some transfusion for ineffective erythropoiesis induced manifestations like extramedullary hematopoiesis, uh, facial deformity, uh, growth and uh, development uh, problem. Uh, they may need transfusion for these reasons. So they don't need transfusion, regular transfusion for survival, but they need transfusion for other indications. And as I mentioned, so there are a lot of uh, manifestations. Uh, they can cause facial deformities because of bone marrow expansion. There is increased iron absorption from the gut. There can be increased iron overload from the blood transfusion. They can cause iron overloading causing uh, cardiac hemosiderosis, causing endocrinopathies, so on and so forth. Uh, for NTT, uh, the pathophysiology is same. Uh, the, the thing is, as the, the abnormal cells, abnormal RBCs are not replaced by the fresh RBCs, they develop a lot of uh, hypercoagulopathies and vasculopathies and cellular uh, changes. Basically, so they are mainly characterized by leg ulcers, different thrombotic events, pulmonary hypertensions, as well as iron overload, mainly because of increased iron absorption from the gut, and they cause endocrinopathy and features of iron overload like beta thalassemia major as well. So complications are like this, anemia, iron overload, endocrine complications, osteoporosis, cardiac complications, different infections, mainly in splenectomized patients other complications of splenectomy and uh, definitely the psychosocial issues. So the, it is a multi-system disorders and causing a lot of clinical manifestations uh, like this, leg ulcer, stunted growth, psychosocial complications, splenectomy and its complications, delayed puberty, defect in growth and development, thrombotic complications, uh, this thing. So uh, we have guideline by Thalassemia International Federation. Usually, uh, while managing thalassemia, we follow this guideline in our day-to-day -day practice uh, if we don't do any uh, specific clinical trial in thalassemia. So uh, this guideline on TDT published in 2021 and the latest uh, guideline on NTDT published in 2017. So my, my uh, uh, talk on the management of thalassemia will mainly based on this guideline along with some references uh, from other sources. And we have, uh, that is uh, national, that is NHM guideline also published in 20, 2019. So this national health mission, uh, under this national health mission, we have now HCP, hemoglobinopathy and hemophilia control program and different states has adapted uh, this program and uh, my state was Bengal also part of it. So we, we run, our thalassemia control program under HCP, hemoglobinopathy, hemophilia control program, which is under national health mission. So the management of thalassemia is mainly the blood transfusion, then iron overload, splenectomy, management of endocrine complications, osteoporosis management, management of cardiac complications, and then as far as the curative aspects, stem cell transplantation and gene therapy, and definitely the psychosocial support. So the transfusion and management, it is the most important component of thalassemia management. Now, the, the philosophy is of transfusion and management of thalassemia is the patient is having anemia. So, uh, you know, we need to uh, transfuse them with RBCs uh, as the patient is having anemia. At the same time, the main problem of thalassemia is ineffective erythropoiesis. So we need to uh, transfuse the thalassemic patients so that their ineffective erythropoiesis is suppressed. And, uh, and, and, and by that way, the other complications of ineffective erythropoiesis will be managed. 
So we need to uh, balance the uh, transfusion, RBC transfusion, so that ineffective erythropoiesis is adequately suppressed. So there are some uh, criteria for starting, uh, you know, trans transfusion. That is, uh, if hemoglobin is less than seven on two occasions at two weeks apart, so that is an indication for start, uh, starting uh, transfusion. But there are other criteria also. If there is significant uh, symptomatic anemia, if there is poor growth development, if there is complications of extramedullary hematopoiesis, uh, or there is significant extramedullary hematopoiesis, these are also indications along with the first indications like, like the hemoglobin cutoff of seven. Now, uh, which blood product is to be given? So uh, it is said that relatively young, relatively uh, relatively fresh blood uh, needs to be infused so that the post transfusion survival is there within the patient's uh, body. So PRBC stored for less than two weeks uh, is ideal for transfusion, and better to give a leuco depleted blood product that is uh, a blood product with less than one in twenty to the first six leukocytes per unit because the leukocytes are associated with a lot of complications, especially in, in uh, thalassemia. So they can cause transfusion related infections, uh, uh, complications. Huh? Uh, they can cause febrile non hemolytic transfusion reaction. They can produce, help to produce allo antibody formation, anti HL antibody formations. So that's why uh, leuco depleted blood product is preferred. Now, before starting uh, thalassemia transfusion, because the patient, as the patients are chronically transfused, patient will be chronically transfused. So we need to give a phenotype match. At least a limited phenotype match uh, RBC, because otherwise they can produce an allo antibody formation. Because it is a common problem what we see in chronically transfused, mainly in TGT patients, TGT and both in and in DDT patients also, that after a few transfusion, the hemoglobin doesn't uh, have an expected rise following transfusion. So, and, and, if, if, and if we check, we can see that there is around 20 to 30% cases that allo antibody are formed. So, and that's why along with A, B, and D, we need to do the RBC phenotype for capital C, small c, capital E, small e, and K. So, these five panel extended RBC is essential for the uh, thalassemia transfusion, and we need to give this limited uh, phenotype matched RBC transfusion. And, uh, uh, and, and, and in, in regular transfuse patient, we need to do an allo antibody screening also. Uh, and what should be the threshold for beta thalassemia or for TDT? The pre transfusion threshold has kept between 19.5 to 10.5 because it has been seen that it can adequately suppress the ineffective erythropoiesis. The, if we keep the pre transfusion hemoglobin between 9.5 to 10.5, the ineffective erythropoiesis will be around two to four times of the normal. So that is manageable. But if we want to maintain the norm, there are different uh, transfusion uh, strategy, hyper transfusion, super transfusion. So if we want to maintain the normal hemoglobin, then the amount of blood to be transfused would have been huge. And the amount of iron overload will be so huge that it would be difficult to uh, reduce them by iron chelation. So this is the uh, standard uh, pre-transfusion threshold, which is recommended by TIF for TDT. Uh, for E beta thalassemia or for NTDT, there is no uh, strict cutoff. Uh, TIF has mentioned that you know, if the hemoglobin is less than five, then we should transfuse, or if the patient has other indications for transfusion. And we have seen that if we maintain the hemoglobin of five, definitely patient develops other complications like facial deformity, extraordinary hematopoiesis, uh, you know, uh, defect in growth and development. So in our institute, we, we maintain a cutoff of seven gram per GL. And in, in different studies also, they have shown that if they maintain seven gram per GL, uh, they usually maintain, the patients usually maintain the normal growth development and the level of ineffective erythropoiesis also are significantly suppressed. So the mean 
target hemoglobin is 12, the post transfusion hemoglobin is 12 to 14, and pre transfusion is around 9.5 to 10.5. For EBITDA, we keep it around 7, but it is not standardized. Uh, there is an is an uh, formula of uh, what should be the volume of uh, blood uh, which needs to be transfused. So it is there. And when the hemoglobin doesn't rise adequately even after transfusion, so these are the possibilities. There can be allo antibody formation. There can be features of hyperspinism. There can be an older blood, poor quality blood. Uh, there can be any other sources of bleeding, like bleeding piles or bleeding from guard, anything. So that we needs to be uh, need to find out. Leukodepletion that I already mentioned, and there are three types of leukodepletion: pre-storage, that is when when uh, uh, leukodepletion uh, was done before RBC preparation, PRBC preparation, pre-transfusion when the leukodepletion done after PRBC formation. PRBC preparation and bedside filtration. And best is definitely a pre storage filtration. And it can prevent the non hemolytic febrile transfusion reaction, HL aluminization. It can prevent the trailing or the, uh, uh, trans the, 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 the that is, WBC transmitted infections can be prevented, like CMV, Epstein Barr virus, etc. RBC, sometimes it is used for allergic reactions because sometimes uh, patient may develop allergic reactions after transfusion, which is mainly uh, plasma proteins. So that can be cleared by washed RBC, but it has some fallacies also. It can, uh, if we wash RBC, then it can reduce the uh, hemoglobin content. It is, it becomes an open system. Chances of infections will be more. So these are the, these are there. So it is nowadays not that much uh, you know, practiced. There are other RBCs, I think, which is mainly theoretical and uh, it is it doesn't have that much significant value. And in day-to-day -day practice, we don't we don't use uh, these products like cryopreserved RBCs, you know, by uh, donor aphoresis, by neocyte transfusions, cross concept there. But usually, it is not a routine practice to use this. So this is the summary. Summary uh, basically, there is nothing new. I have already covered all these issues. Basically, before, before putting a patient on regular transfusion, we need to see whether the, the indications for transfusion was a transient indication or it is a regular indication. So in thalassemia, in, in DDT patients, definitely we need to uh, keep the pre-transfusion hemoglobin 9.5 to 10.5 for normal growth and development. But for NTDT, uh, you know, we need to decide it is, it is individualized. But definitely, before starting a regular transfusion, we need to do an extended RBC phenotype and to give leukodepleted phenotype matched blood. And if patient doesn't respond uh, adequately to transfusion, we need to look for the allo antibody formation. So this is there. Complications: acute transfusion, chronic transfusion complications, transfusion infections. This is there. Acute transfusion reactions is mainly the most commonly febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction. It can be acute hemolytic transmission reaction because of ABO mismatch mainly, allergic reactions because of plasma proteins. Then trally, TACO, these things can be there. And coagulopathy also can be, uh, is a possibility if there's a massive transmission and infections. Chronic is aluminization. TAG, VHD can be there. So we need to avoid the family donors for that. And definitely the long-term complications of transmission like iron overload and transmission transmitted infections. Aluminization, I have already mentioned, uh, the, the most allogenics are usually capital C and KEL, but other are also responsible. There is 20 to 30% chances of aluminization. And uh, chances of aluminization is much more in TDT compared, in NTDT compared to TDT. That is, those who receive uh, infrequent transfusion or intermittent transfusion, the chances of allo antibodies are much more there. TAGVHD is another complications, infections, hepatitis C, B, HIV, and CMV uh, it is there. So there should be a safe transmission policy involving the blood bank, the physicians, as well as patient and patient's relative for a safe transfusion. Now, then the next complication of thalassemia is iron overload that we know that normally around two gram of erythron are required to produce our uh, normal RBCs per day. 
and the source are mainly the macrophages, uh, which which uh, the source is basically the destroyed RBCs regularly, and gut, where one to two milligram of RBCs uh, of iron are absorbed, and it is transmitted by transferrin, and the transferrin keeps iron in the safe transferrin bound form. But if there is iron overload, uh, be it because of increased absorption from the gut or because of this uh, increased transfusion, so the reticular endothelial system can be saturated, transfusion, transferrin may be saturated, and there can be formation of NTBI, non transferring bound iron. Basically, this non transferring bound iron that is a labile iron that is the toxic to cells and they cause a lot of cellular toxicities and organ toxicities. In NTDT, the main source of iron overload is gut and operational transfusion. So, this labile iron or non transferring bound iron, they produce a reactive oxygen species, causes repeat peroxidation, cellular damage, and a lot of other complications like. Uh, cardiac failure, liver cirrhosis, endocrinopathies, infertility, uh, and cellular damages, as well as vasculopathy. So uh, that that they cause. Now monitoring uh, the the ideal monitoring is uh, liver iron concentration assessment of liver iron concentration, but the other methods are uh, serum ferritin. Liver iron concentration usually. Uh, pre Previously, uh, we had to do uh, liver biopsy, but it is an invasive. Now we uh, estimate liver uh, uh, estimation by MRI of liver or MRI heart. Squid is not available, so it is not so important. Is serum ferritin, which is available in almost all the centers where thalassemia patients are being treated, but there are some fallacies. And uh, nowadays, the ideal method of iron estimation is MRI of liver and iron. So uh, cardiac iron estimation and liver iron estimation we can do by T2 star MRI. There are fallacies in, in ferritin. Uh, we, we know that uh, advantage are a lot because it is available, it is inexpensive, and it is easily, it can be done. But disadvantage are uh, they are acute phase reactant. And in NTDT, they actually don't represent the uh, total iron overload. The ferritin doesn't represent the total iron overload, mainly in NTD. And LIC is ideal. It is, it is uh, best done by MRI. But again, it is expensive and it is not available in all the centers. Uh, although a 1.5 Tesla MRI machine is sufficient for that, but we need to have a standardized uh, uh, this thing, software, and, uh, and need to do it regularly. So, Many of the centers in India uh, performs LIC. We we have one center in in Kolkata also. So so this is the uh, estimate. We can see that serum ferritin, uh, as far as the thalassemia major is concerned, it it maintains a linearity. But for for thalassemia intermedia or NTDT, the serum ferritin doesn't represent the total iron iron concentration. That is LIC uh, for a particular LIC. The serum ferritin level is low as far as the thalassemia intermedia or NTDT are concerned. And that's why the threshold for starting uh, chelation is low if we uh, assess the iron overload by ferritin only. So, and this is the monitoring of iron overload. It is recommendation. And uh, you know, after it needs to be done every three monthly by serum ferritin, and uh, every six monthly to one yearly by liver MRI concentration. Now, chelation. So, what is the principle of chelation? Chelation is nothing but uh, we, we bind the labile metal with a chelator and form a metal chelator complex, which is a uh, safe complex, which is non-toxic, and it is excreted either by stool or urine or both. So the strategies are preventive therapy, that is before starting chelation, before uh, adequate or significant iron overload is there. Rescue therapy, when there is already iron overload, we, we are treating to reduce the iron overload. 
and emergency therapy is when the patient develop complications of iron overload like, like cardiac failure in those cases often the combination uh, of iron chelators are used and uh, those adjustments are necessary it, it is not that once I, we start the chelation and just patient go on taking it because there are complications of iron chelator also we need to adjust our dose as per the iron overload and we need to ensure that there is adequate adherence to the chelation therapy. So uh, we need to first prevent the accumulation of iron by starting treatment enough before the iron accumulation, then and to minimize the toxicity. So these are the available iron chelator, desferioxamine, uh, uh, which is hexadented. One is to, it forms very strong uh, you know, compound with iron. Then deferacilox, the tridented two is to one combination, then deferiprom. Uh, you know, because of some side effects, deferiprom uh, usually uh, you know, not commonly used nowadays. So deferacilox, most commonly the molecule used for chelation is now deferacilox. And in some cases, we use desferioxamine, especially uh, before transplant when we need to rapidly reduce when uh, during if the patient develops complications like cardiac failure, so we use a desferioxamine or double chelator. Yeah. So, uh, you know, delivery for desferioxamine is mainly subcutaneous or continuous IV. Uh, Half life is 20 to 30. And, uh, and, and it needs to be given at least five days a week because the, as labile iron are there in the plasma, so we need to ensure that the chelators are present continuous in the plasma for effective chelation. So, so according to the half-life, we, we ensure that the patient, uh, we, we, we adjust the doses so that we ensure that there is 24 hours uh, presence of chelation in the plasma. As far as deferacidox is concerned, it is orally available. It is 12 to 16 hours is half-life. And that's why we give once daily dose. And deferiprone, the half-life is three to four hours. So we give tedious three times a day. The recommended dose of desferioxamine is 30 to 60 uh, milligram per kg, five to seven days per week. For deferacidox, depending on the TDT and NTDT, the doses varies. For TDT, the dose ranges from 10 to 20, maximum 30. For TDT, the ranges is 20 to 40 milligram per kg once daily dispersible tablet or we can use now a film coated tablet the dose is 70 percent of the dispersible tablet and for deferiprone 75 to 100 uh, milligram three times a day so uh when to plan if the patient is more than two years of age there is 10 to 20 transfusions or as far as TDT is concerned, if the ferritin level is more than 1,000, then we should start. And we need to stop when there is ferritin is less than equal to 300 or LIC liver iron concentration is three milligram per gram uh, per day. And intensive or combined chelation to be given when the ferritin level is more than 2,500 or LIC is more than 15 milligram uh, per gram. Or sometimes, before planning bone marrow transplant. For NTDT, the cutoff is 800. The cutoff, the, the threshold is usually less compared to the, the TDT. So if it is less than equal to 800, then we start chelation at a dose, usually at 10 milligram per kg. And we adjust accordingly. And if it is less than 300, we stop, but we monitor. Uh, there are some different, uh, you know, guideline how to escalate, how to de-escalate. So, and and we need to monitor that because to to reduce the chelation-related complications, chelation-related side effects. Uh, you know, uh, we need to regularly do the ANC if we give deferiprone, but uh, for other chelators, it is not necessary. But creatine assessment needs to be done for deferacidox twice before starting and then weekly for first month and then monthly. Usually we do three monthly in our center. 
for alt ast assessment that is also we need to regularly follow for the uh, phylloxerox as well as for this free examine pioton audiometry and ophthalmology annually uh, needs to be done for the phylloxerox so this is some sum up of the diphtheracilox therapy because we, we we give it regularly that's why so tdt more than equal to 2 years for ntdt usually it is more than equal to 10 years but we can start early and we need to titrate uh, as per the guideline we need to monitor the patients for the chelation related toxicities as i already mentioned splenectomy is also an important component but the thing is when a patient needs splenectomy if a patient needs splenectomy that means the patient was not properly managed usually practical recommendations are age more than 5 years worsening of anemia leading to poor growth and development hypersplenism massive splenomegaly the splenic infarction so these are the indications for a splenectomy but it is associated with a lot of complications also and we need to be very cautious about that especially we need to uh, give a immunoprophylaxis and post splenectomy we need to give chemoprophylaxis with penicillin at least for 5 years so uh, this capsulated organism are very common post splenectomy so we need to give a essential vaccination like h influenza pneumococcal pneumococcal and influenza and uh, meet but but you know uh, and and all this is supportive care so uh, to cure thalassemia the transplant is the only option at present and another another uh, strategy is there that is the hemoglobin f induces because i have already mentioned uh, at the beginning that it is not the defective globin which is responsible for the pathophysiology it is the normal unpaired alpha chain which is responsible for all this complication so if we can balance somehow and the way the easiest way to balance is by inducing gamma chain so that the alpha chain gets its companion in gamma chain and it forms the hbf uh we know that there is a switching in the perinatal phase and the main main component of this fetal to adult switching is bcl 11a they help in switching so uh, so in in uh, bcl11 polymorphism often we see that there is an increased hbf because the switching is halted and uh, by stimulating this bcl11a we have different strategies including uh, this is gene therapy which can help to prevent the imbalance of alpha and gamma so genetic modifiers for beta thalassemia is co inheritance of alpha thalassemia the symptoms will be less if there is triplication or quadruplication of alpha thalassemia then uh, beta thalassemia carrier carrier state also can behave like a thalassemia intermediate and the percentage of hemoglobin s so a uh, different genetic modifiers are there for hbf induction like xmn polymorphism bcl11 a polymorphism klf in klf1 mutation which actually controls the bcl11 a expression so myb uh, you know uh, intergenic region uh, so polymorphism in these genes are responsible for variation in hbf uh, amount and variation in the clinical manifestations also and and uh, this bcl11 a plays a very important role and by inducing the uh, there there is a suppressor of bcl11 a so if we suppress that suppressor then they can act like an inducer for hbf so in that way also uh, we can increase hbf so uh, this is a therapeutic target uh, to in, to to uh, correct the impairment of alpha beta hemoglobin ratio that is hbf induction and hydroxyurea is a known hydroxyurea is a known agent for this hbf induction it prevents the ribonucleotide reductase and it causes stress erythropoiesis and this stress erythropoiesis can induce the hbf production and lot of studies are there which had showed the benefit of hydroxyurea and uh, in in thalassemia patients also we have done few studies in in our center in kolkata 
which showed that hydroxyurea induces HBF as well as hemoglobin concentration, but there is no linearity between the HBF induction and HBF increase. Uh, there is statistically significant, and this optimal study is a very landmark study. And uh, this landmark study also showed the benefit of hydroxyurea in uh, thalassemia patients. Usually the, the, the dose is 10 milligram per kg per day, but they can be increased up to 30 milligram per kg per day. These are different studies on hydroxyurea in thalassemia, which showed uh, you know, significant improvement. And uh, for, for NTGT patients, this optimal care study, they also showed the, uh, the importance of uh, hydroxyurea in reducing the transfusion uh, burden for thalassemia patient. There can be epigenetic modifiers also, which can uh, induce the HBF and uh, which includes uh, this HDAC inhibitors or DNA methyl transferase one inhibitor. So they are also there, uh, like decitabine, acetidine, short chain butyric acids. These agents can induce HBF. And we, we have few studies uh, in, uh, in different centers of India, as well as in uh, Calcutta Medical College. There is studies with decitabine, there was a, which showed an increase uh, HBA production and increase hemoglobin production following this injection compared to the normal population. There uh, is showing HBF at successive follow up visits compared to hydroxyurea. It showed an uh, increase in the uh, HBF level. And there are some thalidomide studies also and uh, in different parts of in internationally as well as in different parts of India, which showed that thalidomide also important in inducing HBF as well as in increasing the HB hemoglobin values. So these are study by the Vijay, Vijay Ramanan, uh, which who showed the improvement of HBF level and hemoglobin level uh, after giving thalidomide in beta thalassemia major patients. And this multicenter study using thalidomide in NTDT patients it was shown that thalidomide actually can cause uh, HB increase as well as HBF increase. So a lot of studies are there, so I'm not going into detail. Uh, so both TTT and NTT patients were included in this study and uh, overall response rate was 93.5% and major and uh, minimal response was 62%, 0.9% and 30.6%. And this study was done in Tata Medical Center, uh, Kolkata to see, uh, it is a retrospective study in E-beta thalassemia giving thalidomide. And uh, here also they showed that there is increase in the hemoglobin, those who receive thalidomide. There is 76.1% overall response as far as the uh, hemoglobin amount is concerned. And this study was done in our center, Inverus Medical College, that it is an it is a three-arm comparative study, uh, placebo versus hydroxyurea versus thalidomide in E beta thalassemia. It is the first international study, randomized study. Uh, where uh, uh, in E-beta thalassemia, the thalidomide compared to hydroxyurea and placebo were assessed. And it showed that there is significant increase in hemoglobin level. And it, 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 it was raised as high as 2.13 gram per DL. And there was significant reduction in the blood transfusion, those who were on uh, thalidomide. So the first documented study on E beta thalassemia patients, and uh, no, sorry. so there are a list of HBF inducers like decitabine, azacitidine, hydroxyurea, short chain fatty acid, and thalidomide. So uh, they have shown some improvement in HBF level. 
And then the curative aspect, the curative treatment is the practical curative treatment is definitely transplant. And uh, is long-term transfusion and chelation free life can be achieved. And we know that after starting transplant, there is significant improvement in the overall survival over years. So if you compare the thalassemia survival in 1960s to uh, 90s, so there is significant survival advantage, mainly because of this bone transplant. And uh, there is 80 to 88 percent improvement in the overall survival uh, following mass sibling donor transplant. And uh, this study in HLA mass sibling bone marrow transplant for beta thalassemia, there was 19 centers, and 50 uh, percent were from India. Myeloid conditioning or Bucci ATG in most of the cases. And it showed a significantly improved outcome. Mainly in SRO1, the outcome was very good. Uh, the class one usually have uh, overall survival of 94%, class two is 77%, but class three has got an overall survival of 53%. So, uh, you know, uh, the transplant cannot be the, uh, the like magical uh, process if we don't manage thalassemia properly, if we don't do a proper uh, transfusion, if we don't chill it properly, then the outcome of transfusion is not good. So basically, we need to uh, treat the thalassemia from beginning so that the patient remains in class one or class two, and then the full advantage of transplant will be, will be achieved. And now altering that uh, conditioning regimen, we can have a good outcome even in class three, but you know, we should try to keep the patient in class one or two by proper non-transfusion management, and then we can get the actual advantage of transplant. Uh, there are some novel therapies also in thalassemia now. Uh, you know, so novel therapy in, in, in different aspects, as far as iron overload is concerned, iron chelation is concerned. So there are different novel therapies. The one is loose pattern set. Uh, you know, it, is, it is now coming to India. So it is an erythroid maturation agent acting on the late stage erythropoiesis. It is the first in class erythroid maturation agent that neutralizes TGF beta superfamily ligand. And they actually enhance the late stage erythropoiesis. And uh, if we give loose pattern set, there is around 22 to 25% improvement. How much improvement? Around 33% improvement in the transfusion requirement uh, in TDT patients. But it needs to be given subcutaneously, and patient may need to come every three weekly to the to the centers where it is available. Uh, gene therapy is another therapy. So gene therapy has two two strategies. One is gene addition or replacement by correcting the abnormal gene by lenti lentivirus uh, method. But there can be a gene editing also. This gene editing basically manipulate the CL11A or KLF1 and they increase the HBF level and decreases the alpha non-alpha imbalance. So by gene editing method, uh, you know, thalassemia can be controlled, can be managed. And these are the different gene therapies. That is the Betisel method, uh, which causes insertion of modified beta globin. Uh, that is globe method or there can be a CRISPR-Cas9 or gene finger directed method. So these, there are different uh, novel medications for beta thalassemia, loose pattern shape, sotatar shape, serolimus, uh, to prevent the iron absorption, apotransferrin, and uh, ruxolitib also can be used as a JAK1 to inhibitor to, to reduce the ineffective erythropoiesis and reduce the screening. Yes. Uh, Spinomegaly, hepcidin mimetics can be used for decreasing iron absorption. These things are there on different phases of trial. So, uh, so in future we can see the novel agents uh, outside this uh, transfusion 
chelation and transplant. Uh, there are few, after this overview of discussion, there are few case discussions. I will rapidly go through it. So a 27 year old female presented with sudden onset paraparesis, MRI finding showed a uh, paraspinal mass. So if a thalassemia patients develop a sudden onset paraparesis, we need to uh, see the uh, paraspinal uh, areas by MRI. And the biopsy from the mass showed that there is features of extramillary hematopoiesis. And uh, uh, you know, the CBC uh, showing that there is hemoglobin is 7.7, .7, there is microcytic hypochromic anemia. But while doing uh, this thing, HPLC, it's showing a beta trait status. When we did the ARMS PCR for beta mutations, we found IVS15 heterozygous. But when we did the alpha mutations, there was triplications of alpha thalassemia. So if a beta trait is behaving like a thalassemia intermedia, having extra medullary hematopoiesis, so we need to look for alpha triplication or alpha quadruplication. And in case of uh, extra hematopoiesis, we need to, uh, you know, uh, manage it properly. We need to keep the hemoglobin pre transfusion hemoglobin a little higher threshold to suppress the, the uh, ineffective erythropoiesis. It is better to keep more than 10. In emergency condition, we can give the local radiation therapy and definitely hydroxyurea needs to be given for HBF induction. So these are the management of extramillary hematopoiesis. This is the algorithm uh, given in the TIF guideline low-dose radiotherapy, short course transfusion, as well as hydroxyl. So it is the treatment modalities. Uh, often thalassemia patients present with hypercoagulability and uh, you know there can be infarction, cerebral infarction also. So venous thromboembolism is not rare specifically in NDDT patients. And uh, you know, if if we if we because the main mechanism of uh, thromboembolism or uh, thrombotic manifestations of uh, in thalassemia is here the RBCs are defective. So following the membrane injury either by reactive oxygen species uh, by uh, by labile iron or by uh, this unpaired alpha chain, there is flip flop. And this flip flop means the phosphatidyl serine is come out in the outside. And this phosphatidyl serine provides a phospholipid surface. So, actually, uh, in thalassemia patients, mainly in NTDT patients or inadequately treated TDT patients, the RBC behaves like an activated platelet. So, in that way, they cause the sculopathy and promote the hypercoagulability. Uh, so we need to have a, a, a we need to keep this thing in mind, the hypercoagulable manifestations. Uh, this patient of uh, thalassemia intermedia, 47 year old, may develop a sudden onset chest pain, dyspnea, and eco finding may show the features of pulmonary hypertension. There can be a pulmonary embolism also. So, uh, you know, average 30% of patients of NTDT may develop pulmonary hypertension. The range varies from 10 to 78.8%. And it should be confirmed by right heart catheterization, but echocardiography also by assessing the tricuspid valve regurgitation uh, can give an idea of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, advancing age, splenectomy, history of thrombosis, these are contributing factors in pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, if it is, if TRV is more than 2.5 uh, ml per second, then patient may be asymptomatic. But if the tricuspid velocity is more than 3.2, the patient is likely to develop pulmonary hypertension. And patient may need a uh, more frequent uh, transfusion and adequate treatment for pulmonary hypertension. Hydroxyurea is an important component for that. Often, sildenafil uh, can be used. There is risk going for pulmonary hypertension, uh, depending on age more than 35 years, that is beta thalassemia or hemoglobin E, time after splenectomy, 
Okay. So, and this score may help in assessing or in predicting pulmonary hypertension. Uh, the patient may develop a chronic back pain. Often the patient of thalassemia develops a bony pain. And DEXA scan uh, may help us to find out whether the patient develops osteopenia or osteoporosis or not. And in cases of, by, by if it is, if the TIS score is more than 1.5 standard deviation, then uh, it is osteopenia. I mean, it is, if it is more than 2.5, it is an osteoporosis. And these patients may be, uh, we need to uh, rule out the presence of vitamin D deficiency. The parathyroid hormone needs to be assessed and they may benefit with these phosphonates. Uh, these phosphonates, uh, you know, one or two doses of this phosphonate every three months, this is also sufficient uh, for uh, osteoporosis, managing osteoporosis in thalassemia patients. Endocrine complications are, are not very rare. The patient may develop amenorrhea. We need to do, uh, uh, patient may develop hypogonadism, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, that is the main cause of growth uh, impairment in thalassemia patients. And tanner staging is very important component of thalassemia management. We need to uh, uh, do regular tanner staging, especially in the adolescent child. And uh, adequate replacement therapy needs to be given for the growth acid, growth impaired patients. So we, we need the help of endocrine department. So thalassemia is basically a multi-system disorders and we need support from orthopedics, from uh, endocrinologists, from pediatricians, from transfusion medicines. So all these supports is needed for an ideal management of thalassemia, hypothyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, these things are there. So, uh, you know, considering the current scenario, now we are going beyond the usual management of thalassemia like transfusion, chelation, and as a curative method, transplant. So there are a lot of novel agents, a lot of different strategies, gene therapies are there. So hope for thalassemia treatment worldwide is there. And there's immense effect in community management of thalassemia because government is taking up thalassemia control program as a national program. And as a part of that, I think in future, uh, it can be significantly, the burden of thalassemia will be significantly reduced. And we shouldn't forget the preventive aspect. The preventive aspect doesn't mean the only counseling because it has been seen that preventing marriage from one career with another career is not effective in any country. So to actually, if we want to reduce the thalassemic birth, we need to stringently uh, make the availability of prenatal diagnosis in, in all the states, all the centers. So by applying prenatal diagnosis, we can actually reduce the thalassemia burden. Uh, thank you. This is the last thalassemia patients, which I have transplanted a few months back. The patient is doing well. So I'll be happy. So if there is any questions, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Summarizing intricacies in the management of thalassemia in such a small time is a tough task. And thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful class. It indeed was a masterclass, and I'm sure that all the participants have, must have benefited and learned a lot from your clinical experience. Uh, in the chat box, I can't see any questions, but uh, there are three hands raised, so I would request the river route uh, to unmute those uh, attendees so they can ask their questions. If, we, if you have any questions, then you can... Not in questions you can discuss if you if you think something some issues. So, so it was it was a, it was a wonderful class and it was just a revision a complete revision of all thalassemia covering like yeah I was, I was wondering how to cover thalassemia management in forty five minutes so I don't know whether I could cover it or no, not. Sir, you have covered almost every aspect and sharing those clinical cases and. Uh, Giving the bits of all the complications which can be seen in thalassemia, it was a very wonderful session, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, so, whether we can conclude the session if there is no question? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, I ask permission from uh, ISPD Secretariat to, uh, uh, to conclude the session. Uh, okay, so if, if we do not have any questions in the chat box or nobody is 
anybody nobody is asking any question then we can definitely conclude proceed thank you thank you very much sir thank you very much sir for yeah. thank your... you thank you abriti and thank you ishbt uh, for uh, thank you rajiv sir thank you abriti ma'am for coordinating the class